With its thick forests and many rivers, nature has always provided people in the Mount Elgon region with an abundance of food, water, shelter, and security. Mount Elgon used to be a very productive region. The rich volcanic soil produced high quality crops. However, today communities in deforested Mount Elgon are faced with environmental and economic challenges. Land use change and heavy rainfall are causing damaging floods and landslides. These terrible disasters are occurring more and more frequently. In 2012, one landslide on Mount Elgon left 250 people missing and 100 dead. Two years earlier, another took 360 lives. These events uproot entire communities, their livelihoods, and their environment. Now, we are going to be a little bit of a little bit of a Four of them were recovered, and four of them remained in the soil. Obviously, these events do not only affect the families and the communities involved. As the breadbasket region, floods and landslides in Mount Elgon also impact the food supply of the whole nation. When the rains could come, eh, the, wat the water really could run away and they sweep away the topsoil. And even sometimes when the rain is heavy, you know, even the water can be too heavy and it sweeps away some crops, some, some houses, so it wasn't so good. And this area was really flat. When the rain rains, it re really flat everywhere. When you walk inside, you sink. And then the water comes up to the knees here. Floods and landslides pose a particular challenge for all sectors of local county departments, which deal with the consequences. For example, the Agricultural Department looks at environmental disasters from the perspective of the loss of crops and fertile soil. In the Health Department, one is confronted with extra costs to address malnutrition and water-related diseases. The Education Department worries about children missing school for long periods. The Infrastructure Department is most concerned about the damage to electricity, roads, and bridges. That said, each department works on its own solutions and approaches to deal with the consequences of floods and landslides. This, however, is not enough. It is now high time to join forces and jointly invest in preventing natural disasters together. Working together not only spreads the burden of the costs of prevention, it also allows for solutions to be drawn by a larger, diverse pool of intellectual thought from different perspectives. Mount Elgon face natural disasters once every 10 years. Today, however, floods and landslides happen every year and are becoming more severe. How then can we address the main challenges that Mount Elgon communities face today? Before delving into solutions, let's first dissect what is causing the increase in floods and landslides. There are four main root causes that we, at the moment, are not dealing with. The first is dysfunctional natural infrastructure. The whole of Mount Elgon is a natural infrastructure that offers numerous ecosystem services to the people. However, our human footprint in the area has caused the degradation of a range of useful ecosystem functions. Forests that help to regulate the flow of water after heavy rainfall have been replaced by cultivation of crops on the mountain slopes. Therefore, nature's capacity to deal with floods in Kenya and landslides in Uganda has been impaired. Unsustainable agricultural practices. Forests and other natural vegetation that once stabilized the soils in Mount Elgon have been replaced with agricultural crops. Crops such as maize and new non-indigenous trees such as eucalyptus are instead abundant in the area. However, these newly introduced crops and trees are not adapted for the saturated soil of Mount Elgon. Gone are the roots of indigenous trees and grass species that were holding excess water. It is this excess water that now causes floods and landslides. The third root cause to tackle 
his inadequate knowledge on how to turn natural challenges into natural solutions. Many new inhabitants of Mount Elgon are out of touch with indigenous farming practices. New conservation knowledge also does not reach the farmers. For instance, communities are planting too close to the river. This not only causes soil erosion, but also impacts the frequency of floods. As a result, riverbanks expand and then collapse, which in turn causes an increase in sediments, water pollution, and floods. The fourth root cause to tackle is weak local natural resource governance systems. There is disconnect between farming practices and district, county, and national policies. Self-organization of communities is too limited and weak to deal effectively with the challenges. There is no capacity to pass on traditional and modern practices of farming and natural resource management. If we want both communities and ecosystems to become more resilient, we have to address all four of these points simultaneously. It is for this reason that IUCN works in close collaboration with local governments and communities to promote nature-based solutions. Experimenting with these nature-based solutions has provided ample evidence that these four challenges can be addressed successfully. The approach that is working. Participatory establishment of water conservation and land management structures. The first intervention helps build water and land management structures. This intervention tackles the problems caused by the lack of infrastructure to cope with the natural flow of water. For example, in order to slow down water runoff and prevent soil erosion, communities are taught to build trenches, trash lines, shrub and grass barriers, and plant indigenous trees. To manage excess water, people are taught to create drainage channels. To control flooding, farmers are taught to avoid cultivating near the riverbanks. Many people from the community came and we began digging the trenches. They decided to plan to, to make these trenches so that to hold some water in order not to sweep the other part, the crops. Long ago, our soil was going down by the rain to the river. But now, when IUCN came, they teach us how to use the trenches. Now our soil is not going to the river, and our now soil is very strong. Now our food is well. When IUCN came, they help us according to they help us to open the channels which are here in the farm. So the channels help us to train the water. Diversifying markets, livelihoods, and ecosystems. This second intervention is designed to help people diversify their income by varying crops and therefore markets. The majority of the population relies directly on the environment to sustain themselves. In addition, people also have a lopsided dependency on farming a single crop, such as maize. Yet, the land is increasingly getting exhausted and is in limited supply. Community farmers are now planting a wide variety of indigenous vegetables and fruit trees. People are even experimenting in beekeeping. This diversification has allowed farmers to increase their incomes. Before ICN came, people were planting on only, uh, only maize. But since ICN came, people are now planting indigenous tree, and that culture of planting trees is in them. And we are also growing other crops, like fruit trees that are beneficial for our health. And these indigenous trees are helping us to control soil erosion and to address the issue of climatic change. To plant a variety of crops is not just great for families to increase their income. It also helps to improve soil health. It balances food demand. It also improves fodder for livestock animals. The story of Alice Nakungu is a great example of this intervention to diversify markets and livelihoods. Alice used excess rainwater to build, with the help of IUCN, a fish farm. I have four fish ponds, and I have 800 fish per month. I sell them to the villagers. The money that I get, I pay school fees for my son. All of the interventions require community involvement and training. This brings us to the third intervention, 
practical training, and demonstrations on sustainable water and land management. The third intervention aims to improve the capacities and skills of farmers through demonstrated water and land management practices at learning centers. Farmers learn how to structure natural infrastructure, such as grass barriers, with built infrastructure, such as canals and trenches, to determine the best ecosystem services that Mount Elgon can provide the community. The learning centers have become a place where people can see and experience the fruits of good farming practices in soil and water management. As is cultural, once a community member wants to adopt similar restoration practices, the entire village comes together to help build and learn at the same time. In village trainings, farmers also learn how to organize themselves and plan together. The sub-county chiefs and village chairmen support their village teams. The chiefs and chairmen are also responsible for implementing sustainable farming rules that were agreed upon by the community. One of the farming skills that has been successfully revived is the customary technique of leaving a six meter buffer zone before starting to plant crops. This helps to prevent runoff. More important, however, this also allows for the natural vegetation to grow back. These indigenous shrubs, grasses, and trees help to keep the water clean. Cleaner water, of course, means that you are healthier and can even save money that you would have spent going to the doctor. In this example, sub-county chiefs and village chairmen enforce the six-meter buffer zone rule. Originally, we used it to dig from there up to the river. And when IUCN came, they told us how to demarcate six meters away from the river. And we are planted there, our indigenous trees, and no longer the, the water is washing away our topsoil. Farmers work with IUCN staff and local government technicians to learn how to measure the trenches to be dug on the slope, what type of crops and trees to plant, and why. The practical training and coaching also teaches farmers how to organize themselves and how to plan together. Farmers divide themselves into village teams and are supported by their sub-county chiefs and village chairmen who are responsible for ensuring that people's cattle do not eat the seedlings of indigenous trees and grasses that are planted close to the drainage channels and trenches. This brings us to the fourth intervention, enhancing self-organization among communities. The fourth intervention is designed to connect local communities with county governments and to encourage the use of traditional natural resource management and governance systems. Communities are working with local authorities to strengthen natural resource governance. Frequent visits are facilitated between IUCN, local governments, and farmers. Often these visits trigger the behavior change and provide communities with positive feedback. They also are combined with training in management and governance skills. Although IUCN set up the platforms for local interaction, the process is spontaneous. For instance, local authorities are now working on the village level. Extension officers work closely with the local farmers to discuss the challenges and solutions to reduce the risk of floods and landslides. Self-organization is subsequently improving information flow. It also creates dialogues and encourages planning together with a wide range of stakeholders. A great example of the spontaneity of self-organization is seen with the Busamo Women's Group Choir. The women, who lost family members in one of the bigger landslides in 2012, came together to raise awareness about using nature-based solutions to deal with the risks of landslides. These were examples of nature-based solutions in high-risk areas, driven by local communities and assisted by IUCN and local environmental authority staffs at the environment desks. To really have an effect, however, this approach needs to be scaled up. Imagine if all sectors of government that now work separately on damage control join forces and resources in prevention and investing in nature-based solutions. Many problems in Mount Elgon could be solved. The strength of the ICN project is in its integrated approach. It doesn't only benefit uh, environment, uh, the benefits are in education, benefits in agriculture, in infrastructure, as well as in health. IUCN Resilience Framework approach has brought in a lot of positive change to our district through reduced runoff in terms of soil and water, 
uh, through improving yields of our agricultural productivity, uh, which eventually will lead to better health of our communities with the major aim of developing a resilient ecosystem and a resilient community of Manafa district to the effects of climate change. How can and should local authorities help to upscale this successful approach? If we, as different sectors at the county level, start to think nature, what first steps should we take to improve the resilience of communities and ecosystems? These are important questions to ask. Nevertheless, what we do know is that to make a difference on a county scale, local governments need to take ownership of the IUCN approach. All sectors have to coordinate their resources to deal with the consequences of floods and landslides, and to make the transition from reactive policy to proactive policy. IUCN is ready to assist. Are you ready to make a difference? What would you need to take the first steps to start working proactively to deal with floods and landslides? To form a partnership where all the departments can share resources, contact us via email at info.asaro at iucn.org.